Hello and welcome friends. Welcome back to the India International Center's India's Neighborhood First series. Uh, the topic for the discussion today is the coup in Myanmar, implications for India. As you can see, India's region is the most happening place. You got a imperfect peace process in Afghanistan. You got news of some fresh peace between India and Pakistan, already disengagement between India and China, a constitutional coup overturned by the courts in Nepal. You got power, power battles in Sri Lanka and in Bangladesh, Al Jazeera is reporting some of the most fantastic news that one could have heard. So a very happening place indeed. But our focus today is on a country which we discussed last year. Some of you would recall, we talked about the great transition to democracy in Burma, Myanmar, and how the elections were taking the country on that democratic path. Who would have thought in that month last year that we would be discussing a military coup, the third of its kind in Burma. And this is in an area which uh, is strategically very important for India. It is India's eastern flank. And on this eastern flank, in fact, the Home Minister uh, yesterday who's somewhere in that part of the country, uh, referred to it as the economic hub of India. It is the center of gravity for India's Act East policy, India's Indo-Pacific strategy. In India's four border states have shared borders with Burma. There are residual insurgencies in that area. So it is an extremely important strategic flank for India. And for a coup to have happened at a time when India was hoping to take off in that direction, that is the Great East, uh, this is obviously a setback. So to look at the implications of the developments inside Myanmar, Burma, if you like, uh, we have an extremely star-studded panel. Uh, we have with us Ambassador uh, Rajiv Bhatia. Uh, he's a former ambassador and a distinguished fellow at the Gateway Foundation. Uh, Dr. Uday Bhanu Singh, a senior research associate at the Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis, and I've known him since the early 90s, since when he's been following uh, Burma, his favorite country, or amongst his favorite countries. And of course, last but not the least, uh, the redoubtable Gautam Mukhopadhyay ambassador uh, from, he was there in um, Myanmar, uh, and, and of course, Afghanistan and many other places. Um, your moderator, I'm General Ashok Mehta, and I'm a frequent visitor and a student of that country. So the four of us will try our very best to fill you up on the latest developments. And uh, then we will take uh, a Q&A from uh, the audience. But the immediate format is going to be something like this. Um, the first speaker will be Ambassador Rajiv Bhatia. He will be followed by Dr. Uday Bhanu Singh and then by Ambassador Mukhopadhyay. Uh, that will be followed by a brief Q&A and I will be asking the questions of the panelists and then I will seek your questions in the chat box and ask relevant people what you sought to know. Um, so let me start now. Uh, Ambassador Bhatia, you have 
10 minutes, preferably 10 minutes, but don't go beyond 12. So it's your floor, Ambassador Bhatia. Thank you very much, uh, General Mehta. It's such a pleasure to uh, receive this invitation to take part uh, in this webinar under your leadership. It's an extremely uh, astutely conceived initiative, and I'm so happy to see my old friends uh, uh, Gautam uh, and Uday taking part uh, in this uh, deliberations. I think our attempt very much would be to uh, convey the essence uh, of uh, this uh, very riveting, uh, sad, but important drama that is unfolding uh, in front of us. Thank you very much, IIC, for uh, uh, planning the session and setting up all the logistics. And uh, my greetings to all the viewers and all the members and their guests uh, who are here uh, listening to us. As we can see, the topic has two segments. Uh, and therefore, I'm going to confine my presentation to those very two segments. First, the coup in Myanmar. Second, implications for India. So straight away on the first segment, uh, you know, which obviously should explore the causes and consequences of the coup. Uh, and uh, our first point very much would be that uh, this development has to be seen in the context of uh, the country's history, particularly uh, for the period 1962 to 2021. Uh, this is the period when uh, for uh, all the time except the past uh, 10 years, the country was under military rule. Uh, and for the past 10 years, starting from 2011 to now, uh, it uh, had enjoyed what may best be described as hybrid democracy or a partial democracy. Uh, because there was uh, sharing of power uh, sanctioned by the constitution between the military uh, and uh, democratically elected uh, party, which was the NLD in this case, led by Aung San Suu Kyi. Now, the very first question is, was it a coup? Uh, or as the most of the world thinks, was it a transfer of power as the military claims? Or was it just a cabinet reshuffle as Beijing will have us believe? Uh, I think uh, the answer of General Mehta and the IIC is very clear. It was a coup in Myanmar. Uh, I agree. Uh, but I would submit that it was uh, a coup with a difference. Uh, for two reasons, I'm saying this. First, because as I said, uh, uh, the military in Myanmar already had a uh, uh, half loaf of power with it. On 1st February, it just decided to help itself with the second half of the loaf as well. Uh, and it did so claiming that it is under the constitution. But frankly, purists uh, like us would not agree. It was very much uh, an illegal seizure of power. So it was a coup. Uh, the second reason why I regard that this was a coup with the difference is uh, to invite you to look at the military's ideology, mindset, and self-image. Uh, Myanmar military regards itself as the custodian of the state. It feels that power belongs to it. And its argument is that we brought independence to the country. We saved it from disintegration. We uh, uh, you know, brought development, economic development to Myanmar. And above all, we also introduced democracy to Myanmar. So because of all these reasons, it is we who would decide uh, what kind of democracy the country can have. And they believe uh, uh, in the concept of disciplined democracy. Essentially, that means that it is a democracy in which uh, the military has a role to play and it will continue to enjoy that role to play. Now, the second aspect, the coup happened. Uh, it was not acceptable to the people. And a new phenomenon called CDM, Civil Disobe Disobedience Movement, emerged. It has been quite a, a strong, widely spread phenomenon, by, but by no means it's a new one. The country has seen uh, strong, uh, widespread 
non-violent uh, protests largely by the young generation even in the past yet there are new features uh, uh, this was not confined to just a few cities such as yangon mandle and nepito it has gone into various other cities from north to south uh, it is uh, largely non-violent it is facing the onslaught of the military's might uh, but uh, it is to be noted that the other side also has been uh, you know quite uh, showing its restraint and that was uh, reflected in the fact that there were there was use of uh, water cannons and uh, rubber bullets and uh, uh, you know uh, occasionally uh, also live ammunition but the record so far is important to note uh, as far as we know only three people uh, have died so far uh, the number of people arrested uh, is not clearly known but probably it is 1000 people or less what the military does is to keep uh, uh, arresting and detaining people and keep releasing them as well so nobody probably knows precisely as to how many people are in the jail today because of cdm now the next issue is will the military prevail or the people will win beside these two scenarios the third one which frankly i am partial to is that maybe the situation is heading towards a protracted impasse where neither side secures a complete victory and therefore looks around for some kind of an exit from this terrible mess that the country is facing because clearly uh, normal civic life has been disrupted economy has been affected the entire world is excited about what is going on there and therefore we know uh, about uh, the international reactions international reactions have been along uh, the expected lines uh, the west is uh, really excited uh, uh, about um, about the uh, you know violation of human rights uh, it has gone into the sanctions mode the us uk eu australia new zealand uh, and they are essentially talking of immediate restoration of the democratically elected government this was one of the phrases used i think by president biden uh, except this is not really correct because uh, the democratically elected uh, government uh, as i said was only using uh, or was given half of the power the other half of power was very much with the military and that is why the very careful and astute phrase used by the indian government the process of uh, the restoration of democratic transition uh, reflects the reality and it also reflects the differences uh, among those who want democracy but want democracy in the burmese or myanmar context china uh, obviously keeps coming up uh, i will not go into detail i would only say that when it comes to dealing with myanmar china holds in its hands both carrots and sticks unlike india which essentially holds carrots uh, and therefore as general mehta said rightly uh, this is uh, a country bordering on the eastern flank of india strategically very important but we have to uh, be very careful in dealing with uh, this explosive situation so at this stage having spent 5 uh, minutes let me now turn to the second part and talk briefly uh, and succinctly about the implications for india uh, i agree uh, with our moderator our honorable moderator who has talked about the central and seminal importance of myanmar in terms of our neighborhood policy about our uh, uh, actis policy and our indo pacific strategy we just cannot afford to have in myanmar an unfriendly country uh, since uh, the beginning we believe that the defense and security of myanmar uh, are uh, ambassador bhatia ambassador bhatia please forgive me for interrupting but uh, you used up most of your time already okay and so i'll finish in 2 or 3 minutes 2 minutes 
Yeah, another two minutes, please. Okay, sure. So that's perfectly fine. Yeah. So essentially, at this stage, all that I can say is uh, that the implications for India are uh, very significant. They relate to the hardcore interests of India. But uh, India probably has no choice except to uh, extend moral and political support for the democracy and democratic forces in Myanmar. And yet, at the same time, keep working to safeguard its four interests. And I'll just list them. We can discuss them later. One is insurgency to ensure that security and stability of Northeast remains intact. Secondly, there is uh, the need for stability in Myanmar to ensure our economic cooperation remains on track. Third, the Rohingya issue and the sensitivities and interests of uh, Bangladesh we can quite clearly see that their return, the return of refugees from Bangladesh back to Myanmar uh, could become even more challenging now. And finally, the geopolitics of the region or to which I have already referred in the, in the uh, in just now earlier with regard to China. So in the end, all that I can say is uh, by way of advice uh, to India, to the government of India, we have to keep uh, monitoring the situation closely. We would have to speak less and less. We should encourage ASEAN uh, in its mediatory efforts. We can discuss what is the latest position with regard to the initiative by Indonesia. And finally, we should be ready to address if the third scenario of protracted impasse uh, actually descends on Myanmar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, Dr. Oday Bhanu Singh, uh, I'd be grateful now that we've heard the background. Uh, so if you can focus more on implications for India, uh, I'd be most grateful, but I don't want to de derail you from what you prepared, but please focus on those implications and China's, uh, China's obvious role in this. Uh, thank you, General Mehta. And my thanks to India International Center for giving me an opportunity to be part of this exalted gathering. Uh, if you look at Myanmar, the one thing that strikes you is that uh, what Mark Twain had said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. The past offers us warnings, but also encouragement. The same would apply to Myanmar after the Tatmadaw has staged a coup on February the 1st. All this sounds woefully familiar. The 10 years of democratic experience from 1948 to 58 is quite like the democratic experiment from 2011 to 2021. And it all began when the parliament of Burma tamely handed over power to General Nevin in 1958. And in 1968, the general staged a coup and stayed on for nearly uh, 50 years. Myanmar has experience of surviving coups and India has learned to engage with the military in its neighborhood. What are the implications of Senior General Min Ong Lang's February coup for India at the bilateral level, at the regional level, and at the global level. What has been India's response to the coup? When it began, India's response was very guarded. As the largest democracy, it expressed deep concern at the developments. And in the press statement, it was said, we believe that the rule of law and democratic process must be upheld. We are monitoring the situation carefully, closely. India seeks to harmonize its relationships at the bilateral, regional, and global levels. And the policies it has uh, followed are the neighborhood first policy, the act east policy, and its Indo-Pacific policy. It would like the three policies to be aligned together. If you look at the neighborhood first policy, the, the neighborhood first policy dovetails into India's Act East policy. The geostrategic importance of Myanmar is very well known. It is the only ASEAN country with which we have land border. 
four northeastern states border myanmar arunachal pradesh nagaland manipur and mizoram and covering a total of 1600 kilometers india's objective is to have a stable indo myanmar border to ensure development of india's northeast which also means that the area west of chenthwin river remains free of chinese influence the other uh, important uh, uh, driver of india's policy which uh, ambassador bhatia mentioned also is the need to control insurgency in the northeast now if you look at our experience in 1995 operation golden bird the joint operation between indian army and the burmese army that was going on fine and then it was halted by the myanmar side because the indian government gave the jawaharlal nehru award for international understanding to aung san suu kyi who was then in opposition now coming uh, fast track forward in june 2015 after 18 indian soldiers were killed by insurgents in chandel manipur the indian army crossed uh, the border in hot pursuit and eliminated two rebel camps and inflicted heavy casualties on a camp operating from sagaing in myanmar myanmar was apparently kept in the loop about this operation then uh, later on in february 2020 also india and myanmar forces carried out operations to push back the arakan army which was threatening the kaladan multimodal project the arakan army forces its weapons from china gets its training from kachin independence army and it was designated by the myanmar government as a terrorist organization in march 2020 many of the insurgent groups whether they are kachins shans or wa based on myanmar's borders they all receive their arms from china the rohingyas who have been denied citizenship by myanmar also in danger of getting radicalized by islamic militants the problem is complicated of course by myanmar being part of the golden triangle uh and uh, uh center for drugs if armed forces focus uh will be on urban protests in myanmar there would be thinner presence on the periphery to manage insurgents so there will be a problem uh that india might face on its borders the double whammy of covid-19 and the backlash against the coup could also lead to an economic recession in myanmar which would have adverse impact on india's northeast because there could be a refugee influx uh looking at the actis policy we have a we may have a temporary setback prime minister modi had unveiled it in nepeda in 2014 uh at the asean summit so the importance of myanmar to uh, our actis policy is self self evident the connectivity projects in myanmar could get delayed on the other hand uh because india has maintained its relation with the military this time could also be utilized to speed up these projects and the joint visit by india's foreign secretary and chief of army staff in october 2020 showed that india could use military and diplomatic arm to promote its foreign policy objectives in neighboring country which has an authoritarian streak the kaladan multimodal project when completed would connect sitwe port in rakhine uh, with mizoram and also with kolkata uh once completed it will provide landlocked northeast connectivity to the bay of bengal uh along with this uh, it's also important to remember that india has delivered 1.5 million doses of covid shield vaccine for the people of myanmar on 26 january this year now coming to the indo-pacific policy india's vision for the indo-pacific is well known and uh, india has kept away from the chinese belt and road initiative for uh, primarily for sovereignty reasons uh, relating to the cpec on our western frontier but our projects intersect in myanmar the trilateral highway of india with china's 
China Myanmar Economic Corridor CMEC. So the trilateral highway and CMEC will intersect in Mandalay. When the Chinese President Xi Jinping visited Myanmar in January 2020, uh, 33 important agreements were signed. Earlier in 2018, Myanmar and China had signed an MOU to establish the China-Myanmar Economic Corridor. The 1,700-kilometer economic corridor is meant to connect Kunming to Myanmar's economic hubs, first to Mandalay, and then east to Yangon and west to Chokfu. A framework agreement on Chokfu was also signed in November 2018. This would provide Indian Ocean access to landlocked, uh, uh, landlocked as far as Indian Ocean is concerned, to Yunnan province of China. Thus, Myanmar's position on Belt and Road Initiative, Act East policy, and the Indo-Pacific policy under the military rule would have implications for India's policy as it frames it on Quad, the Quad Plus, and the Indo-Pacific. Myanmar has also been witnessing recently some panic vigilantism as some returning Chinese workers have been targeted. Local workers refuse to get back to work until those nationals leave uh, Myanmar, are isolated or are tested to show themselves free of the virus. An uh, example was the Tepadong copper mine in Sagaing region. Uh, in the midst of COVID-19, China was pushing for these BRI projects. Now, uh, Professor, may I uh, please request you to wind down? Two minutes, uh, I'll, uh, I'll be open. All right. Uh, if I present you with some uh, scenarios uh, that we could uh, visualize, scenario one could be when democracy returns to Myanmar and the Tatmadaw retreats. Scenario two could be when there would be a stalemate and the military brings in a new constitution and holds election or holds elections without uh, a new constitution, maybe just a revision of this constitution. And scenario three would be military rule continues beyond one year with more repression. Uh, from our vantage point uh, at the moment, it appears that the military is likely to hold on to power for some more time. Uh, in conclusion, I would say COVID-19 has reignited the power struggle among the main stakeholders in Myanmar the military, the political parties, and the ethnic groups. India will have to be prepared to deal with whatever scenario that finally emerges in the country. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, friends, you'll agree that so far, uh, with the background set by Ambassador Rajiv Bhatia, with the loaf, half a loaf of bread, and uh, to the stalemate scenario, and the three possible situations or contingencies defined by Professor Udaib Han Hussain, uh, we have a reasonable understanding now of the direction in which we are moving. And I'm hoping that Ambassador Gautam Mukhopadhyaya, who is the last of the speakers, will be able to put all this into context and and, and kind of crystallize this so that we get a clearer picture of what is likely to happen in the foreseeable future, if that is possible. Ambassador Gautam Mukhabadhyaya, uh, 12 minutes, please. Right. Um, thank you, General Mehta, and thank you as well as the India International Center to, for inviting me to this very distinguished uh, panel. Um, I will actually uh, cover the point that you've asked me to cover, but let me start off with the background that uh, you, uh, you know, you, the questions that you gave us. So, uh, on the coup itself, let me make a couple of points. The reasons for the coup are constitutional, institutional, as well as personal. It is constitutional in the sense that the 2008 constitution was actually never designed for a fully civilian government or a civilian government that pushes back the military. Uh, in fact, it was designed to keep out the M NLD, and it was specifically 
there were specific clauses to keep out Do Aung San Suu Kyi from becoming president. Uh, the 2008 constitution was designed to keep the military perpetually in power from behind with a civilian party in front that would be uh, more or less amenable to their control. And of course, the civilian party of their choice at that particular point was the USDP. Uh, and the first term of the USDP under Thein Sein passed off actually very harmoniously from that point of view. More importantly, uh, the office of the president, it was never conceived that the office of the president uh, would be from someone uh, other than uh, the uh, backed by the military. So even the coup as it took place uh, uh, was uh, was uh, uh, was was flawed in in law because under the constitution uh, the coup could only be conducted at the initiative of the president and in consultation with the national defense and security council uh, uh, it did not ever visualize that the president would be detained and a first vice president would be elevated to the point position of an acting president who would then uh, hand over power, all power, that means military, administrative, judiciary, legal, uh, legislative, all power to uh, the military. So from that point of view, even though it has invoked the constitution, uh, it is very clear that it's against the spirit and frankly also against the letter of the constitution. It's a very dubious use of the constitution. It is institutional for another reason. I mean, the Tamado is very much a regimented institute, uh, believes in kind of institutionalized power. Uh, and uh, uh, one of its complaints against uh, Aung San Suu Kyi is that she, in a way, uh, centralized and concentrated and personalized power in herself. So it was really a clash between institutional power, the coercive power of the military versus the people power of Dong Sang Suu Kyi, and particularly the appeal, the charisma that she had. So it was really a clash between military power and, uh, uh, and people power and institutionalized uh, you know, structure of uh, uh, governance uh, versus what they think was a highly personalized uh, form of governance, which to, for, which to some extent was uh, uh, true. Now, uh, so this is the, the background to that. And in many ways, it was also, and I think all this was compounded and, uh, and presented itself in a serious personality clash, a very bad personal chemistry between uh, Min Ong Lang, the senior general and commander of defense services, and Do Ong San Suu Kyi, who by this time had uh, used again the constitution to make herself the uh, state counselor. I will add one thing, that during Do Ong San Suu Kyi's term, she did not really advance democracy very much. Uh, most of the efforts at so-called democratization were really focused on, uh, you know, her on the amendments to the Constance Constitution, the 2008 Constitution under which she contested the elections, uh, to be able to push the military back a little and to be able to give herself more power to 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 run the country. Uh, one of the reasons why the military was extremely upset at this was one loss in 2015 was bad enough that. The, the, the USDP lost and the military lost power and they were confined to their three ministries as well as the 25% share of power in the parliament. And please also remember that any amendment to the constitution uh, requires a 75% vote in parliament, which was effectively preempted by the fact that 25% of the members of parliament were elected by the, the CDS. Uh, so one loss was bad enough. A second loss in 2020 was intolerable. Intolerable because they expected that Dong San Suu Kyi would use this to push the military even further, to push the military's role not just in the security sector, but also largely in governance, but also in the economy. Remember, so long the, um, uh, the USDP and the military were in charge, uh, the Tabado also had a privileged position through its economic companies, through its uh, commercial companies. In, in many ways, uh, uh, deciding the course of the economy in winning contracts and in awarding contracts and so on. With the opening of the economy and with Dong San Suu Kyi taking control of the economic militaries, with the foreign investment laws that she brought in, in fact, economic power was beginning to shift from the military to the civilian side. And I think one very fresh news of uh, perhaps yesterday or day before uh, was that they have also, the military has started rounding up a number of the business people who have been associated with the NLD in the very recent past. 
And the personal chemistry, chemistry, I think we all know about it. I mean, very simply, uh, there was absolutely no communication or contact and there was no chance. And there is no chance now that even if we succeed in bringing uh, the you know the senior general and Dong San Suu Kyi back to the table for a conversation. There is virtually no chance of the kind of cohabitation that continued for some time and looked as though it was likely to be possible. Now, in terms of the uh, choices and the implications for India and particularly the role of China, I would like to say that yeah, the role of China we have to you know for the reasons that Pradeep Bhanu explained very well just now. Uh, because of China's CMEC, because of its, uh, you know, its ambitions to uh, to have a presence at the Bay of Bengal through Chofu, because of the corridor that would link southern China, southwestern China with the Bay of Bengal and the Indian Ocean, and the general strategic objectives that go on with the BRI, uh, India has to take China's, uh, you know, penetration in Myanmar into consideration. But I would hesitate and I would be wary and I would caution that uh, China should not be the principal uh, dis, uh, dis, uh, decider in the kind of posture that we take on the issue of democracy and uh, the the and the coup and the military, because India has various other reasons to remain engaged with uh, Myanmar, and I will just quickly rattle out uh, uh, many of them. One is, if at all, as we say that we wish the restoration of the democratic transition and democratic process and the rule of law, then it's essential for us to keep channels of communication open. With a military with the military component of Myanmar, remembering that the military controls the entire coercive apparatus, the entire security sector of the uh, of the Myanmar government. In fact, the civilian government has absolutely no say in the security sector in Myanmar at all. Now we need, unlike let's say the United States, which has no material stakes uh, in Myanmar. Uh, India has to take into account the security of its northeast, the presence of insurgents in Myanmar. Uh, it has to take into account the China factor. But I would also say that it has to take into account, for example, that Myanmar hosts about 2 million people of Indian origin. Who, uh, for, who would feel abandoned and betrayed if India simply left the scene altogether? Uh, there is also the fact that in order, you know, our development projects are aimed at the people. But in order to be able to execute and conduct our development projects, uh, we have to go through the portal of the government. And we do not want to be closed off that. And we shouldn't forget the fact that, you know, India and Myanmar have had 2000 years of, you know, civilizational and historical and cultural neighborhood. The 50 years after 1962 were an aberration in our history when suddenly we actually virtually forgot that we were neighbors. We turned our backs on each other. It is with great difficulty over the last 20, 30 years that we have, uh, you know, managed to cultivate a relationship with the Myanmar army, which unless and until the army comes under civilian control, will remember, will remain an important arbiter of Myanmar's destiny, as well as, uh, you know, security concerns. Uh, so unless, uh, so for some time, we are obliged to even in terms of being able to maintain our contact with the Myanmar people, we have to remain engaged with the government. That does not mean that we have to be pro-military. We will always and we should be with the people, with the democratic process. But that does not mean that we should not and cannot have an engagement. Uh, so I think for various reasons, uh, you know, and Uday Bhanu also mentioned the kind of shocks that we had in 19, 1962 as well as in 1998, where uh, where we were virtually, you know, uh, cut off uh, from uh, from the Myanmar people uh, for those very reasons. So may now, I, given this, yeah. may I ask you please to wind up? Yes, exactly. So given the three choices that we have, I think the choices that uh, we have, we have to be with the people. This Myanmar is a little different from what we saw in 1962 and 1990. Uh, in the 10 years that have come by, we have had a new generation that have tasted freedom. Uh, we have had a new generation that has learned the use of social media. Uh, we've had youth-led, uh, you know, uh, uh, protests in Hong Kong and Thailand. They may not have succeeded, but the difference between Hong Kong and Thailand and uh, Myanmar is that in Myanmar they have had military rule for 50 years, and I think the protests indicate the kind of unpopularity that the uh, military government uh, faces. And this time, 
I think the protests are going to be to the finish. They are not going to result in a compromise. It may be a prolonged statement, uh, but I see very little chance of the military being able to restore the kind of control that it was able to do in 1990. Uh, in fact, Minong Lang himself has said that he wants uh, multi-party democracy, but a multi-party democracy through a loyalist uh, party or a king's party is now going to be out of the table. And uh, uh, it's a question of how long this face-off will last, but it's very clear in the choice between the people and the military, uh, our, support, our sympathies lie with the people, our sympathies lie with freedom, our simply, sympathies lie with democracy, and that's where we should be going. But without the kind of break and sanctions uh, that uh, uh, some countries are advocating. Uh, we have to maintain a policy of engagement for the various reasons that I have uh, stated. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, uh, friends will agree that uh, we have now a, a pretty reasonable understanding of what happened as far as the uh, military takeover in Myanmar was concerned and uh, what the implications there are for India especially uh, with the kind of uh, interests that the government of India and the people of India have invested in their northeastern borders. And for all the various reasons that our three eminent panelists have underlined. Um, so the first question that I would want to ask uh, Ambassador Bhatia is this. You talked about the half loaf that the military has already got. And so what was that terrible insecurity besides the what uh, Ambassador Mukhopadhyay referred to as personal, institutional, and constitutional? Uh, what was the insecurity on the part of the military at this particular moment of time with uh, the ability of the NLD unable to change the constitution because to achieve a 75 per a three quarters majority to change the constitution is simply not achievable. So if the military has what it has, uh, corporate interests in the wealth of the country, uh, three power ministries, all the other perks that have been defined in the constitution, what is it more that the military was, what is its other yeah. half loaf? Yes, uh, I think, uh, thank you very much. I'll make uh, very clear three uh, straight points. Uh, the, the basic trigger uh, after uh, the November elections last year was a sense of uh, insecurity on part of the military and a sense of overconfidence on part of the NLD and Madame Aung San Suu Kyi. Military's insecurity arose from the fact that they feared that uh, uh, Madame Suu Kyi with a fresh landslide was going to be very assertive and would be very difficult to be controlled with or without the constitution. Uh, and this was very clearly reflected. It is not somebody's conjecture. If we read uh, the reports closely of what happened three days before the coup was announced, you know, in this day and age, everything comes out. There's a legendary report by the Reuters which describes the scene when the Lieutenant General appointed by Minong Lang was sent to talk for the final showdown with the two top aides of Madame Aung San Suu Kyi. And he presented the idea that the election was fraudulent and that complaints must be looked after. And then the, the Union Election Commission should be disbanded. And these two said, no, sorry, nothing of this sort will happen. And you know what the Lieutenant General said? He said, gentlemen, you are insolent and rude. And that was the critical point uh, where things began to go wrong. Uh, in addition to the three uh, reasons that my dear colleague Gautam has mentioned, I would also add the fourth reason, which is ideological reason. As I said from the beginning, uh, no matter what uh, the democratic forces uh, say and think, the Myanmar military believes that it is entitled to power. 
and therefore it has a reason to believe that it must run democracy of its own my final point general mehta is uh, to express my uh, respectful uh, disagreement uh, with uh, gautam when he says uh, we should be with the people i would like him to define we is he referring to the indian government is he referring to the people and civil society and business and the rest of us in india i think everything depends on that definition we have to recognize the limitations of the government the government in my view should speak less should keep its options open express its political and moral support for democracy in myanmar but should continue to deal with whoever is wielding power in ap2 thank you um, i'll i'll come back uh, to ambassador mukhopadhyay on that question raised by ambassador rajiv bhatia but a question for professor uday bhanu singh is that what is precisely um, the objective of the military is the objective of the military to destroy the nld to get rid of so called uh mother su or the iron the, the lady what is the objective of the, of the military is it to get a thai model of democracy what is it that the uh tak madao that is the military is seeking to install as a power sharing agreement a pakistani model or a thai model very briefly though you are mute you are mute please unmute yourself please unmute yourself uh can you hear me now yeah yeah very briefly professor uh i think with the experience of uh, five decades uh, military rule i think uh, the military has uh, basically got uh, accustomed to uh, uh, ruling the country and uh, this new uh, environment which it finds itself in it is not able to adjust to itself uh, adjust to it and uh, perhaps uh, what uh, you are suggesting uh, the the thai model might be the kind of thing which uh, uh, they are looking at rather than what we were earlier assuming would be the indonesian model the they have taken some uh, elements of the indonesian model uh the dwi fungsi part of it and uh, have their own businesses and so on but uh, they are not willing to uh, share um, uh, the um, become uh, democratic in the way that indonesia has become in the recent years uh, so it is uh, uh, perhaps a lack of understanding of where the forces uh, of democracy are going today i think the military uh, is in a kind of time uh, warp and uh, perhaps uh, that is the problem okay thank you professor uh, let me uh, turn towards ambassador gautam mukhopadhyay uh, who has uh, who's been queried by uh, our uh, esteemed rajiv bhatia on we the people and uh, so besides answering uh, that question uh, that he has raised uh, the question i want to add to this is that um, does the military uh, or can the military does it have the capacity uh to transform the nld or break break up the nld because i think it was you who said or was it ambassador bhatia who said that she the the lady didn't bring too much of democracy herself and uh, so is 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 that is that possible is is that possible a new political formation which is a combination of usdp plus 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 and it is minus minus nld so kindly add this to the we the people okay um thank you general mehta and of course it's a privilege to get into a kind of nuanced debate with uh, my senior colleague and uh, mentor ambassador bhatia on the issue of uh, you know the kind of policies that we adopt but let me address your question first 
you know, it's tempting to believe the, the Tamado has miscalculated politically not once. It has miscalculated politically repeatedly. In 1990, with the same thought in mind, it called for elections and lost by over 80%. In 2015, it called for elections. It thought that it had the, you know, it had both the manipulative power through the election commission or through the voting sort of, uh, you know, systems uh, and through the USDP, it thought for those reasons and its reforms and so on, it thought that it could actually have a good chance shot at being able to constitute another USDP type of government with the support of their 25 members of parliament. They miscalculated. This time too, they miscalculated. They came prepared with the grievances, the election about the elections and the irregularities, but they severely miscalculated thrice that you have an NLD which comes back to power with more than 80 percent of the uh, eligible uh, of the votes at least uh, of the popular vote for those seats that really mattered so I think the time for a kind of USDP plus plus NLD minus minus is over uh, I don't think the protesters are going to settle for uh, 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 a compromise that is going to have a kind of uh, civilian face backed by the military this has now I feel that the patience has has gone, but you're not going to get a situation of just simply coming a restoration of the old order because the bottle has been opened. The genie is out today already. The movement has taken on a very youthful, a very leaderless uh, character, mostly led by representatives of civil society, and they are moving beyond the NLD military dichotomy to introduce this whole notion of a federal democracy, a federal de uh, democratic system. You know, by and large, Dong San Suu Kyi, while she did try to push the democratic agenda, as I said, more in terms of the power, uh, uh, you know, the power that she had as a kind of embodiment of people power as opposed to the, the Tamado, uh, the, the reality is that she did not do anything in terms of decentralizing power to the states to the regions, to the ethnic states. And even in a state like uh, 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 like Rakhine, where the ANP, which was a Rakhine party, uh, got the majority in the state elections, she did not appoint uh, or she did not even invite um, the, the ANP to form the government. She appointed a representative of the NLD to be the chief minister in Rakhine. So now what we have is, you know, in fact, there is a trend now that there is something called a general strike committee, uh, uh, which has been formed, which is in fact many ways guiding and leading the, the, the CDM, the civil disobedient movement. It is a controversial development, but it's a development with which the NLD is not comfortable. So what we are likely to see is in fact a kind of advance uh, in democracy towards a kind of much more federal agenda. What we are likely to see is the ethnic areas and the Burma areas once again united towards greater democracy. Uh, we are seeing for the first time greater sympathy within the Dama majority for the ethnic states and uh, you know issues of inequality and self-determination that they have faced in, the, faced in the past. It's going to be messy. There is no clear leader. There is no charismatic figure to lead this right now. Uh, and the NLD will also want its uh, you know place back. It's After all, it is the elected government. Uh, it's not going to be a neat solution, but it's not going to be going back to any solution of the past. And very briefly, Gautam, Gautam, uh, very briefly that we the people, the yes. question. Uh, yeah, very exactly. Briefly. I think my position was already nuanced on that. My position was this, that at some point we have to take a judgment call. Where is this going? Can you imagine a situation where we take the wrong judgment call? If it were to go towards the people and we are siding with the military, even take the case of China. You know, everybody knows China was caught a little off guard by this uh, coup. But tomorrow, if the Chinese decide that they want to switch sides from the Tamador to uh, the, the, the democratic side, they could do so. They have the leverage over the, uh, as a, as a, uh, Ambassador Bhatia said, that they, ha he has, they have the stick as well as the carrot. They could easily switch sides. And then we would be left as the democratic country on the side of the military, while China is playing a role in uh, bringing back some kind of uh, democratic process. And in fact, China has already reached out to the ASEAN in, in, in some kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, diplomatic uh, initiative. Well said. Well said. Now, I have a few questions uh, from the audience. 
and uh, i'll come back to you ambassador bhatia but uh, a question we have um, from mr rp singh um, and, and and this is a this requires a very brief kind of answer in the light of what we have been uh, discussing um, he is asking if there is support for the military from civil society because uh, you, we've seen some uh, counter protests on behalf of the military junta so uh, what is your uh, estimate of the kind of uh, support uh, say out of 10 3 out of 10 for uh, the military junta from amongst the civil society Uh, whom are you asking, sir? Uh, Rajiv Bhatia. Yes, yeah, thank you very much. I think uh, actually Gautam may be in a better position to answer this question since uh, uh, obviously CDM is a phenomenon that uh, he understands and um, studies better. Uh, I think these uh, pro-military demonstrations are obviously a bit of a stunt. Uh, they are. Uh, Uh, showing only very limited support uh, there is no doubt that much of the civil society and people uh, organized movement is favoring democracy but uh, i think to make uh, us understand the full complexity general saab we should note that a major pillar of the myanmar society of the burmese society monks the clergy they are playing neutral by and large today according to my information there have been a very small part which is uh, into the movement the rest of them have been well looked after and cultivated by military so they staying away uh, and therefore uh, all that we can say is uh, that uh, uh, which way the camel will sit we still have to wait and see we cannot jump to the conclusions it's early days thank you uh... ambassador uh, before i uh, get back to ambassador gautam mukhopadhyay uh, professor banu singh uday uh, now on these uh, negotiations uh, the the associations uh, within because there is a question from uh, siddharth raghavan who wants to know whether asean is a is a more suitable organization to be involved in these peace parleys or is it the quad and uh, i think ambassador bhatia did mention earlier that uh, the three foreign ministers i think indonesia burma and uh, thailand is that right thailand they are, they are they are they are meeting in bangkok and um, so uh, can you take it on from there professor unmute yourself please i think the beginning has already been made uh, by asean by uh, especially by thailand because uh, Uh, Thailand would be a uh, more amenable to the uh, military uh, to come to a uh, to a negotiating table than uh, uh, any other uh, country. And within ASEAN, I think a beginning has been made by Indonesia, Myanmar, Thailand to meet together. Their foreign ministers meeting in uh, Thailand. uh which is uh, a step in the right direction uh i don't think uh, quad would be a suitable forum for uh, uh this kind of uh, uh negotiation because uh, of the hard position that the united states has already taken with regard to sanctions and uh, sanctioning of course now it is sanctioning the leadership uh targeted uh, sanctions but sanctions nonetheless uh that kind of uh, approach uh, would make uh, the quad uh, an unacceptable uh, forum for the military to go to uh so uh, i i think uh, the asean uh, has in the past also 
uh, taken an independent position, uh, especially when uh, at the time, if you go back, uh, at the time when Myanmar had to be admitted as a member of ASEAN, they did it in uh, against the will of the West. When West was against uh, Myanmar becoming a member, but ASEAN went ahead nonetheless. So the neighboring countries, I think, are uh, more in tune with the reality on the ground, and they would appreciate uh, it much better. Uh, whether uh, uh, to a certain extent, Japan would be also uh, able to understand the ground reality, but uh, the Quad as a whole, I think, is not a great idea. Right, Dr. Um, Mukhopadhyay. Uh, there's a question from Jayesh Khatu from Mumbai. And I, if I have it right, do you think this? He's asking, do you think Japan has gathered more leverage than India in Burmese affairs due to factors like enga its engagement with the Arakan army? I'm not very clear on this, but would you like to take that on? Please unmute yourself. Ambassador, unmute yourself. My apologies. On the question of Japan, there is no doubt that Japan does have a, a little more leverage than India, maybe considerably more leverage than India, mainly because it has a very large uh, aid program uh, in Myanmar. Uh, and uh, as regards the Arakan army, in fact, uh, Japan did play a role in bringing the Tamado and the Arakan army together. But this was an initiative that in some ways rebounded against Japan because the NLD was left out of it and the NLD was upset about that particular initiative. No question. I think Japan has a foot in the quad and has a foot, uh, uh, you know, as a as a friend of, of Myanmar. Uh, it has contacts with the military. It has extremely good contacts with the NLD as well. Uh, I would say that India is in a bit of a similar position. It has a foot in the quad. Quad, I agree with uh, Dr. Uh, Uday Banu Singh that Quad as an institution, uh, the military would never accept. The ASEAN is a much better uh, forum to lead any diplomatic initiatives, particularly to try to walk back uh, the generals from the step that they have taken, a very unlikely step unless they are li literally driven to a corner. But I think individual countries in the Quad, like Japan and India and ASEAN, could coordinate positions. Um, uh, you know, uh, which are not necessarily, um, you know, as sharp as the Western position. In I did add, you know, to me it was very important that we must maintain our channels of communication with the Tamado, which we have built up over time. We must keep that engagement not only in our own self-interest, but also to be able to uh, help the Tamado if it comes to that uh, with an exit strategy. And by ourselves, we are unlikely to be able to do it. But in in conjunction and in coordination with other countries, like-minded countries, there is a chance that um, uh, con you know, that that uh, a group of countries would be able to play some kind of role. Okay, one one last question for uh, Ambassador Rajiv Bhatia, and this question is from amongst the scenarios that have been painted by all of you. Um, is there a possibility that uh, since the NLD has gone to court, NLD I think has gone to court on the issue of the elections, is there a possibility that you can find a way out if the uh, if the Tatmadaw relents, which is uh, in, in the light of what we have been discussing, not very likely. Uh, is there an outside chance that uh, you might f find some solution from the courts or a peaceful resolution to this uh, imbroglio? I'm touched by the deep faith of uh, the questioner in constitutionalism, uh, which doesn't really obtain in Myanmar. Um, you know, uh, already uh, they have uh, taken swift action to totally change the Union Election Commission. I'm sure uh, they would either change the court or will tell the court what to do. The courts don't really matter at the end of the day. Uh, that is really not the uh, issue at all. I think the, the point that I would like to stress, uh, where I do agree with my dear colleague uh, Gautam, is that 
there is a need for india to make the right call and history is witness to it back in 1988 89 period rajiv gandhi government made the wrong call india suffered immensely for it and it then became incumbent on our generation from 1991 or onwards serving pv narsimha rao government to do the corrective measures people like ambassador partha sarthi ambassador preet malik jain dikshit the foreign secretary and the rest of us uh, ambassador sham saran we contributed to correct the wrong judgment call and that is why i also stress right from the beginning that we should not make the wrong judgment call since we do not know at this stage which side is actually going to prevail over the other side we do not know precisely the end game i think it is important for us uh, for uh, india as a people uh, for the indian government to be very careful and prudent we have hard core interests in that country we have the best wishes for the people of myanmar we have our moral support for them even political support but we must be very prudent and awake in protecting our own national interests uh 30 seconds to each of the panelists to suggest to our audience what in your opinion is most likely to happen in the short term uh starting with ambassador mukhopadhyay yes in the short term my immediate worry is that uh, uh, the demonstrations will lead to violence and clashes uh, and the use of deadly force uh, i think that is one thing that we should try and prevent um uh, most likely uh, th that's the immediate uh, issue i do not see the civil disobedience uh, movement uh, melting away or dissolving or going in the short term so i think we'll have to be prepared for the medium term there is going to be a a kind of a face off and a stalemate that is likely to be at least uh, not uh, not uh, will be much longer than the immediate and we should think uh, of the day and that's the bhatia uh, i would uh, vote for a protracted impasse uh, uh, i would uh, put uh, common sense on part of the military and the people who would probably refrain from violence uh, any large scale violence people in myanmar are peace loving people they are buddhists uh, myanmar military has shown for the past almost a month it can show restraint it is aware of the international pressure so i think uh, next month or two unless uh, an untoward incident triggers a bigger conflict conflict conflagration uh, i would hope that this country uh, will go into a stalemate and allow asean to try to help it uh, professor uday bhanu uh, and i think because because of the uh, pandemic and uh, the political situation in myanmar i think uh, the country is likely to experience an economic downturn and as far as india is concerned the borders are going to be a a problem for us during this period and uh, that means that the projects that we have undertaken uh, would get delayed at least in the short term thank you very much ladies and gentlemen friends uh, you will agree that this has been a fascinating uh, discussion uh, fraught with uh, the kind of future that is unknown uh, but violence our panelists have suggested uh, must be avoided our panelists have also guided us on how india must look at the situation uh, without sitting on the fence engage with both sides as we have done in the past and not make the kind of calls that we once made unfortunately the day when uh, burma myanmar will be a country and a government with the military tatmadaw under civilian control is still some distance away but i want to end on the note 
that uh, Professor Uday Bhanu Singh said, as a military man, I would always be wary of Chinese coming anywhere near the Chindwin flank, the Chindwin river flank, because that is our eastern strategic flank. So on that note, uh, may I thank the panelists for their excellent performance on behalf of the India International Center. May I also thank the audience. There have been some uh, uh, very incisive questions. I haven't been able to get to all of them, but we've tried to wrap some of them together. Thank you for, the, for that. And we look forward to to, 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 to joining, uh, joining up with us next month on the same day on 26th of March for another edition of India's Neighborhood First Series. Thank you very much on behalf of India International Center. Goodbye and Namaskar. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Goodbye.